Well, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Molly Johnson, and I am the Assistant Deputy Minister of the Low Carbon Energy Sector at Natural Resources Canada. I'm very pleased to be here to moderate what is sure to be a very dynamic discussion. Right. And, um, okay, yes, it's going on, thank you. Oh, Maybe, um, could I just ask all of our colleagues and folks who are on the line just before we begin, just to mute your lines, thanks very much. Um, so just uh, before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to, to underscore the role and the importance of the nuclear sector in our collective response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Over the past few months, nuclear energy has enabled critical infrastructure across our nations, keeping the lights on in our homes, our hospitals, our grocery stores, and providing the necessary radioisotopes for sterilization of medical equipment. In Canada, our nuclear sector has stepped forward to help with the pandemic response, retooling manufacturing, making donations of critical PPE, masks, face shields, and to produce ventilators, all while not only continuing to operate the nuclear power fleet at full capacity, but also moving the refurbishments forward and bringing Darlington Unit 2 back online. It's truly impressive, and I'm sure this is the case in many of your countries as well. So over the course of these few months, we have all been reminded of the strategic importance of the nuclear sector, which provides us with the range of benefits to our citizenry, economic, geopolitical, environmental, social, and public health benefits. It's worth focusing on this for a few moments. So as we look forward, as the world turns towards recovery, we have a remarkable opportunity to design stimulus plans that seize the clean energy opportunity and to reshape the energy systems of the future while creating jobs, improving critical infrastructure, and making progress towards our climate change targets. In addition to life extension of full scale reactors and the next wave of innovation in nuclear, small modular reactors are gonna help get us there. As governments, we have a role to play to make sure that we are ready and prepared for these innovations and technological advancements. That means having regulatory and licensing environments that do not hinder innovation unnecessarily, and that enabling frameworks are in place to ensure health and safety and security and protect the environment. So in Canada, we did our homework to ensure policy readiness for this next wave of nuclear energy innovation. Canada's SMR roadmap brought together enabling partners across Canada, the provinces and territories, our Indigenous communities, industry, labs, utilities and academia to chart a path forward for SMRs. Building on the momentum of the roadmap, the Minister of Natural Resources announced earlier this year in late February the federal government's intention to launch a Canada's SMR action plan with our partners this fall. The action plan will report on actions taken by governments, industry, and civil society partners to implement Canada's SMR roadmap. In Canada, we understand the importance of nuclear energy to meeting our climate change goals. Already, nuclear energy displaces over 50 million tons of carbon emissions a year across Canada. And nowhere is this potential of nuclear greater than with respect to small modular reactors. They are a game-changing, emerging nuclear technology that will play a role in reducing greenhouse gas emissions and meeting climate change goals. To enable Canada to reach net zero emissions by 2050, to get off coal by 2030, and to help northern and remote areas move off diesel. No country can do this alone. We know that any successful commercialization of SMRs will be fleet-based, and that means we need to work across borders to develop legislative, regulatory, and policy frameworks that that can accommodate innovative technologies and new business models. And forums like this one are essential. They encourage collaboration. They allow us to have an open dialogue on key issues, to share knowledge, and to disseminate best practices. We know that working together, we will increase our chances of navigating this future. And I also would like to extend my sincere thanks to the International Framework for Nuclear Energy Cooperation for convening this webinar series on opportunities opportunities and challenges facing SMR uh, deployment globally. So before I pass the floor over to our first speaker, I'd like to take a minute just to talk about how this webinar will proceed. So first, we are going to hear from Mr. William D. Magwood IV, Director General of the Nuclear Energy Agency. Then we will pass it over to our four panelists to provide their perspectives on regulatory collaboration. And then we'll open it up to panel discussion. 
And finally, we're going to reserve the last 20 minutes to answer Q's and A's that you might have, questions and answers that you might have. If you'd like to pose a question during this portion, please use the raise hand function. Uh, it's located um, on my screen, at least, in the top right hand uh, corner of your screen. That button will be visible and then we will see uh, that you have got a question in the queue. So, and with that, um, I'm giving my official heads up uh, to our first speaker, um, Mr. William D. Magwood IV, and I will turn to my introduction. So, um, Mr. William D. Magwood IV is currently the Director General of the Nuclear Energy Agency. Prior to joining the NEA, Mr. Magwood served as the Commissioner of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. He has extensive experience in both the regulatory and developmental aspects in, um, of nuclear energy and has provided strategic and policy advice to the U.S. and international clients on energy, environment, education, and technology policy issues. Mr. Magwood, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure to meet you. I'm relatively new into this position, and so this is a first for me. We look forward to hearing your insights on global, the global challenges you foresee related to SMR licensing. The floor is now yours. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Molly, and I appreciate your comments and, and look forward to meeting you in person uh, at some point in the not too distant future. Um, first, uh, welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us uh, for the third of these IFNEC uh, seminars on SMRs. Um, I think they have been uh, truly interesting conversations and I appreciate um, everyone's participation. Um, the Nuclear Energy Agency, as you know, is a technical secretariat for IFNEC, um, so many of um, our staff are involved in assembling this, so I'd like to thank them for their work uh, to make this uh, possible. Um, so from the time that I've been with the NEA, uh, the issue of SMRs has been very much on the forefront of the conversation. Um, we look at this from both a technical standpoint, um, a regulatory standpoint, um, a policy standpoint. And it's been very clear to me that countries around the world have a very strong interest in SMRs, but at the same time, they have a lot of assumptions about what SMRs are going to really look like and what, what we mean by SMR. And I often find that um, the word SMR is a little bit of a Rorschach test, that people see what they want to see when you say it. The reality is that there are really very different categories of SMRs. Uh, clearly, we have the modular SMRs, which have um, ultimately a baseload capability. Um, the new scale technology going through regulatory approval in the US right now is a very good example of that. There are also the single unit uh, light water uh, SMRs, uh, which provide the possibility of more distributed generation. There's a variety of examples of that. Uh, there's also Gen 4 SMRs. These are SMRs that apply non-light water technologies. Um, and then there's also the micro reactors and also mobile reactors. And, I, uh, and those categories are very important because from a regulatory standpoint, they have significant differences and significant challenges that we have to be conscious of. So I think it's very important to keep the categories of SMRs in mind as you go forward with any of these conversations and recognize that SMRs is not a generic term that you can apply um, to everything. Um, but once you decide what type of SMR you're interested in, the question then becomes, how does this SMR become a successful global product? And this is a significant issue. Uh, nuclear, historically, um, has been a technology that um, in, is, is such that the projects are very unique projects, uh, sometimes one-of-a-kind projects that are designed um, and built for a specific site. And while there are certainly technologies, reactor designs that have been used in multiple countries, the EPR from, uh, from um, EDF, for example, is a good example, being built in France and in China um, and, and UK, um, as well as uh, Finland. Um, the, um, there are other technologies, the Korean uh, technology, the uh, APR 1400 being built in Korea and UAE. While we have that, it's, it's more of a rarity to see these technologies around the world um, as opposed to a commonality. For SMRs, 
to be successful, we're going to have to have a market that is available everywhere. Um, and the analogy that we like to use is the analogy of the airline industry. Um, if, uh, if Boeing or Airbus build an aircraft, they don't build it for just a domestic market, they build it for a global market. And they want to be able to, um, to sell that aircraft in many countries around the world. SMRs, at least from an aspirational standpoint, would like to replicate that, would like to be available to a wide market. Um, and not just markets that have um, the, the, the deep nuclear experience of countries like uh, Japan and France and Korea, but also countries that are newcomers, countries um, in Africa, the Middle East, in Southeast Asia. And the question that has come to the fore is how do we make that happen? How do we make that possible? Um, and the answer is that it's going to take a lot of work. Um, I think that basic things like standards will have to be uh, harmonized more than they have been so far. Um, we'll have to have schemes for our operations and maintenance and, what a, and spent fuel. All these things will have to be addressed. But from my standpoint, the, the biggest entry level issue that we will have to deal with is how these facilities will ultimately be licensed. And I think that is a big challenge that we must take on as early as possible. And um, you know, within the NEA, we have had very intensive discussions about this. We're working with some of our members to try to advance methodologies to enable um, some sort of international licensing approach. And what we see is that if it is possible to do this, it is because we were, will be able to look at the technologies of interest in terms of, uh, of a um, design analysis approach, um, where we don't look at site issues, we don't look at um, the specific issues associated with locating a, faci a facility um, in a particular location. We look at the technology, we isolate um, the, the analysis, the safety analysis of the NSSS system and look at that um, alone and then try to see if there is a way of a reaching an international approach to um, to gain approval for that. And that, I think, is going to be necessary for success. Um, because if we have to license each individual SMR technology, country by country, um, as those of you who are in this business know, it takes roughly you know, three to five years to go through the licensing from beginning to end um, for a nuclear technology. And just because SMRs are smaller, it doesn't mean that that is easier. It, it, it will probably still take three to five years. And if we take three to five years for every technology in every country, uh, there's no market. And, 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 and we'll have killed this um, new innovation before it really begins. So we do have to solve this. And I do think it is a solvable problem. Um, I will hasten to say that I do not believe that there will ever be an international regulator. People come to me with this idea a lot. I don't think it's politically possible. I don't think regulators will accept it anyway. But I do think that there is a way for regulators in different countries to work together um, to achieve that end. And, and, and that's something that we are working towards. Um, so this, I think, is a big challenge ahead. Uh, but also, there are other things we have to deal with, including um, dealing with issues of nuclear liability. Um, because if we are going to build these modules, and ship them around the world, uh, we're going to have to deal with the issues of, of, of how nuclear liability um, is, is adjudicated. Uh, we will have to deal with export controls. We'll have to deal with uh, training. So all these issues will have to be dealt with, but, but the licensing is the first one, and that's the one we will try to take on. Uh, finally, I, I think that it's also important to recognize that the people who are most interested in SMRs are often uh, those in countries that don't have the, the infrastructures today to operate nuclear power plants. Um, that's because SMRs um, fit the grids of smaller countries more effectively than large reactors. Uh, the safety parameters of uh, SMRs make them interesting to countries that don't have large regulatory infrastructures. Um, 
So this is something that I think, and our friends at the International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, Greg and his colleagues have worked on a lot in building the, the, the capability and the infrastructure in newcomer countries to make sure that when the time comes, they're in a position to accept these technologies. But at the same time, I think it's important to recognize that the operation of SMRs, the distribution of SMRs to be a global business has to look more or less the same for everybody. We, we can't have different types of customers. They have to, there has to be a bit of a one size fits all approach to this. Otherwise, it, the market breaks into small segments and it becomes very inefficient, it doesn't work. So this is something we have to recognize that the products have to fit the global market to be successful long-term. And that's something I think that we all can work towards. And I think it's something that's worth having because if nuclear is going to play a big role in the energy transition over the next 30 years, it will be because nuclear is built in large numbers. And if nuclear is not being built in large numbers, then it probably will not have enough of a contribution to make it worth the effort for a lot of countries to, to become involved in the industry. Uh, so this is something that we really do have to work on together. It's a very international issue. It's an issue that countries have to come together um, to solve. Um, but I do think we can do it. Um, and I think we will do it because I think if we, if we don't do it, um, then um, shame on us. And, um, and I think future generations will look back at this time and think that we, uh, we did not uh, hold up our side of the bargain. Uh, so with that, Molly, I will hand the floor back to you and thank all of you again for listening and look forward to the conversation. Thanks so much. And thank you for just sort of just shaping out tremendous opportunities and areas for convergence as we move forward. I really appreciate the perspective that you've shared. So um, continuing with the multilateral perspective, we'll now turn to uh, Greg Rezinkowski to hear about how the International Atomic Energy Agency is pursuing harmonization. Uh, Mr. Rezinkowski is the Director of Nuclear Installation Safety at the IAEA. He's responsible for providing programmatic support to IAEA member states in establishing the appropriate safety infrastructure and continuously improving the safety of nuclear installations. Today, he will discuss the IAEA's SMR regulator, uh, Regulators Forum, a body that aims to share SMR regulatory knowledge and experience. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us today, Mr. Rosenkowski, and over to you. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Can you hear me well? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so let me, first of all, thank you, for, thank you for this invitation. I cannot stress enough how important the subject of today's webinar is to the future of nuclear energy, which in fact, lies with multilateral organizations, the member states, and drive for globalization of nuclear safety. As Bill Magut emphasized, we have many, many challenges to overcome to assure a successful deployment of SMRs globally. And those challenges really start from the licensing framework, and we need one size fits all approach from the many reasons which are well planned later in my presentations. But we also have to realize that accidents know no borders and countries need to work together to achieve greater op openness, transparency, and global accountability, both in their own countries and at the international level. And there is a widespread belief that SMRs are a proxy to the future. And this also was emphasized in, in the speech by Bill Magwood. And this presents both opportunities and challenges. SMRs have been proposed as a way to answer some doubts about nuclear energy and demonstrate that faster, cheaper, and better is possible. For nuclear industry, it means short construction time, lower cost of construction and operation, and also inherent safety. Uh, there is much to admire in the designer's ability to innovate because so many different uh, type of reactors have been proposed and they also offer different deployment options. However, the risk in deploying SMRs are in the need for comprehensive validation of the safety case and the lack of regulatory certainty and public acceptance in many countries. 
So getting a social license for construction of SMRs is of existential importance for nuclear energy. And that's very important. That's why we have to start on, on, the, on the right leg from the very beginning. And we have to put in place a very act, uh, effective and very pragmatic licensing process. SMRs and approaches to their deployment challenge the existing regulatory framework. Therefore, as the nuclear industry continues to innovate, so must the regulators. Given the innovative safety features, which are significantly different from those implemented in existing reactors, SMRs are less dependent on safety system, systems, operational measures, and human per performance. It is thus evident that uh, regulatory approach for safety, which is based on the defense in depth concepts conservatively applied to compensate for potential mechanical and human failures, may not be adequate and new ideas should be developed. To be effective, the, regula the regulators must have technical competence and a modern, flexible regulatory framework relying on risk and performance insights. In dealing with new problems, innovation should not be blocked by insistence on old approaches. And this, this is my message to many countries embarking on SMRs. Uh, the next slide, please. This slides provide graphical representation of the IEA's enabling framework and tools available for international cooperations. As you can see, there is many platform of communication, international global communication between all our member states. Uh, provisions for the safe design and operation of nuclear power plants are to a large extent driven by the commitment of the IEA member states to achieve the fundamental safety objectives of protecting people and environment. Although the IEA safety standards supporting the implementation of the fundamental safety objectives and principles can generally be applied to SMRs, IEA staff and experts from the SMR Regulators Forum are working on a tailor-made solution to help national authorities regulate this new class of, reactor, of reactors. This information is shared globally through international and reg 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 regional networks. I will now focus on the SMR's regulators forum. The forum provides support to member states by enabling discussions on relevant regulatory knowledge and experience. Specifically, the forum focuses on the SMR safety and licensing frameworks by identifying and resolving common safety issues that may challenge regulatory reviews associated with SMRs, and by documenting safety implications that arise from the use of new safety features and concepts. The forum's work results in publication of position statements on regulatory issues, information to help regulators enhance regulatory framework, and suggestion for changes to international code and standards, including IEA safety standards. The next slide, please. Uh, the forum initially conducted a pilot project, phase one, to study how emergency planning zones and the principles of graded approach and defense in depth should be applied to SMRs. The pilot project resulted in a report and several position statements on these subjects. In phase two, forum members established new working groups to discuss licensing issues, design and safety analysis, and manufacturing commissioning and operations. Interim position statement on these topics were drafted already. For phase two, potential topics of work are being decided as we speak. The forum uh, met yesterday and the initial discussion took place. So I'm hoping that shortly we'll be able to publish also the topics of future cooperation 
and international collaboration. But nevertheless, you can see already a very close alignment with what Bill Magwood said before me. And it's very important for me to stress that all documents developed by the forum are now available online. The next slide, please. Uh, the work of the SMRs Regulators Forum allows IEA staff to better understand the current state of practice and challenges in licensing of SMRs. Although currently IEA has no plans to develop specific safety standards for SMRs, IEA uses these insights in the establishment of a holistic technology neutral framework for safety of nuclear installations in general, in general which also applies to novel design to help harmonize international approaches by using the existing IEA safety standards. So our idea is to develop this um, one size fits all top down approach, starting from high level safety objectives and ending up on, on specific requirement and acceptance criteria for, for different technologies. So I will explain this on the next slide. So this, uh, this slide show how the development of the technology, uh, technology neutral framework is progressing. The framework consists of a general part that is societal and health objectives, risk targets and high level safety provisions and requirements, which then can be decoupled into national frameworks to address specific regulatory and technical elements. So we will, we will have like a two-tier approach. The top one will be technology neutral, and it, it will be also a perfect opportunity for harmonization of international approaches. And the lower one is technology specific, because there is so many different technologies that we have to consider. And we, but we also will provide member states with tool, tools to extrapolate those technology neutral requirements to the specific aspect of technologies being assessed by member states. Uh, the approach allows flexibility and achievement of a well-judged combination of innovation and proven techniques, which is required to optimize re reactor protection and mitigation measures against general safety objectives and specific risk targets. The optimization of protections required judgment to be made about the relative significance of various safety factors. Therefore, understanding of risks and mitigation, mitigating those risks should play a significant role in the development of the safety framework for SMRs. The next slide, please. Widespread industrialization of SMRs requires a proof of concept and innovative regulatory framework and public acceptance. Therefore, for SMRs to succeed, the nuclear industry will have to call upon everything it has learned and nuclear regulators must work together. Assembling the future of nuclear has to be very systematic. A trial and error approach is no more acceptable. It may lead to cost overruns and a pattern of build first, fix safety issues later. Unfortunately, currently there is no international roadmap to assure that nuclear will not power down for good. So on this slide, you can also find a link to the regulators forum where all the relevant information is published. And this slide also concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you so much. And thank you for sharing the IAEA's approach to facilitating these important discussions. Um, we're now gonna turn it over to Mr. Hugh Robertson of the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. Mr. Robin Robertson is the Director General of the Directorate of Regulatory Improvement and Major Projects Management where he is responsible for managing the licensing of new nuclear reactors. Today, he will be speaking to us about the CNSC's perspectives on regulatory collaboration. So thank you for joining us today, Mr. Robinson, and over to you. Thank you, Molly. I'm very pleased to be here today on behalf of the CNSC <clears throat> to speak on perspectives on regulatory collaboration. 
I'll start by providing a short summary of the CNSC. The CNSC is Canada's independent nuclear regulator. From cradle to grave, we regulate all things nuclear in Canada, uranium mining, nuclear fuel, nuclear power, and research reactors, medical, industrial, and educational applications of nuclear substances, and radioactive waste management. Over 800 staff across the country diligently ensure the licensing decisions and conditions made by our seven-member commission are implemented and respected at all times by licensees. Additionally, the CNSC's four key priorities are to have a modern approach to nuclear regulation, to be a trusted regulator, to maintain our global nuclear influence, and to be an agile organization. I would note on the, the far right of the slide, disseminate, uh, objective scientific, technical, and regulatory information to the public is going to be a very critical activity as part of this SMR uh, uh, projects that we'll be talking about over the next little while, and, and we're very committed to that. Next slide, please. Again, this is just a quick graphical representation uh, of the uh, fuel cycle, and I see we've slipped forward uh, one more slide, so I'll just uh, get on to that one. Sorry, it, uh, back one slide, please. Thank you. While the CNSC will always put safety first, we are also an enabling regulator, and a critical element of this is a flexible regulatory framework. Our framework sets out technology-neutral expectations that are drawn from decades of experience and are based on globally recognized fundamental safety objectives. We regulate in a risk-informed manner and allow applicants to use alternative methods to meet our requirements and safety objectives as long as the safety case can be demonstrated. For example, first-of-a-kind reactors present regulatory challenges due to the lack of OPEX. However, our regulatory framework is flexible enough to establish appropriate margins for safe operation. It is important to note that we are not prescriptive in our requirements. In fact, an IAEA Integrated Regulatory Review Service mission to Canada this past September found our extensive guidance and processes for potential SMR applicants to be a good practice, one to be emulated by other nuclear regulators. We also offer a vendor design review service that provides vendors a pre-licensing engagement opportunity with the CNSC to identify potential fundamental barriers to licensing in Canada. It also provides important learning opportunities for both the vendor and our staff. These efforts will go a long way toward ensuring that we, the nuclear regulator, are not an unnecessary or unreasonable barrier to innovation and advancement. Next slide, please. So in order to be ready for the future, which in my opinion and observation is now, the first thing we are doing is to make sure we have access to the right people with the right skills to be ready to regulate whatever comes our way. In the past few years, we implemented an aggressive staff renewal initiative to ensure we attracted new talent and transferred the valuable knowledge and experience of our veteran staff to the next generation. This has been very successful and we are seeing this cadre of staff assuming greater responsibility and making significant contributions. Additionally, we are currently conducting a comprehensive strategic review of all of the CNSC's programs. Our goal is to ensure that any changes that we make to adapt to our new environment are smart, timely, and durable. Last year, we also established the Disruptive, Innovative, and Emerging Technologies Working Group with the aim of meeting with industry and other stakeholders to identify emerging technologies. This group, which has already met once, will contribute to prioritizing and assessing regulatory implications. Next slide, please. So while we do great work at the CNSC, we know we do not have all the answers or unlimited resources. That is why we strongly advocate for broad international collaboration in nuclear safety and have done so for many years. At the IAEA, CNSC is involved in many different forms, and a few of those examples include this year, our president has been named the chair of IAEA's Commission on Safety Standards. In the past year, our executive vice president and chief regulatory operations officer took part in leading integrated regulatory review service missions to Japan and the UK. As Dr. Jankowski mentioned earlier, a CNSC staff are active participants in all of the SMR regulators forums working groups. This forum has increasingly been asked by the IAEA 
to identify potential gaps in IA safety standards and guides. Recently with the IAEA, CNSC hosted a regional workshop on regulatory framework and licensing issues for small modular reactors deployment with participation from eight countries. At the NEA, CNSC is participating in different working groups, such as the Working Group on the Regulation of New Reactors, currently chaired by one of our CNSC directors, and the Working Party on the Legal Aspects of Nuclear Safety. Next slide, please. We are also working hard at the bilateral level, and as part of our focus on regulatory innovation and readiness, in August of 2019, we took an important step with the USNRC by signing a Memorandum of Cooperation to further streamline and improve the regulation of SMRs, which reflects the strong alignment between our two agencies. We have already made good progress under this arrangement, including defining a terms of reference and establishing an advanced reactors and small modular reactors subcommittee to manage our work. This subcommittee has identified three initial priority projects, including the sharing of regulatory insights from technical reviews of designs, starting with new scale and terrestrial energy. It is also looking at developing common approaches in reviewing new build license applications. Additionally, the CNSC is currently developing a memorandum of cooperation with the UK ONR. This will build on the existing collaboration of technical exchanges and sharing of training programs and development activities. So the CNSC, USNRC, and UK ONR are mature nuclear regulatory bodies that jointly recognize the need for leadership to ensure the efficient and effective oversight of activities that involve advanced reactor technologies. Next slide, please. The CNSC is also engaging with embarking countries by, by providing regulatory insights to countries that are planning to develop their regulatory framework. The CNSC shares the Canadian approach in licensing and pre-licensing processes, most recently in regulating advanced reactor technologies. CNSC staff have provided guidance and delivered training to countries on SMR safety related aspects and licensing issues. For example, we have hosted Indonesian regulatory staff training at the CNSC, which we followed up last year and earlier this year by CNSC staff delivering training in person in Indonesia. We have provided experts at the IAEA regional workshops around the world. This includes Eastern Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. We have been actively involved since 2010 and will continue working with emerging countries to promote nuclear safety. Next slide, please. But it's important to note that industry has a role too. Industry plays a major role in developing proven practices such as codes and standards based on scientific evidence which are used to support design and regulatory decisions. The standardization of proven practices around the world will make it easier to demonstrate adherence to regulatory safety principles. Significant work in this area has already been accomplished under the NEA's Committee on Nuclear Regulatory Activities Working Group on Codes and Standards. Industry should continue to collaborate with the NEA, the IAEA, the World Nuclear Association, CANDU Operators Group, etc. in order to facilitate and drive the standards development organizations such as Canada's CSA and ASME to harmonize practices to the extent practicable. Additionally, safety culture and the quality of the international supply chain has become increasingly important for both factory build and multiple deployment scenarios. This includes, for example, concerns about counterfeit, fraudulent, and suspect items. So we all have a part to play and harmonization is broader than just regulatory requirement and guidance. It also includes harmonization of engineering safety standards. Next slide, please. So while the concept of harmonization may have different meanings to different people under different conditions, the ultimate objective should be clear. If we start with quality baseline information from science and engineering, there is no reason it cannot be used by regulators in any country as a basis for decision making. We have done this before in international nuclear transportation requirements and regulations, and we need to start now by sharing our analysis, testing, modeling, and research to the extent possible. In summary, collaboration simply makes sense. It is more efficient and effective for both regulators and industry without compromising safety. 
In fact, many eyes looking at common safety issues results in an increased level of safety and can be done in a way which respects regulatory sovereignty. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And, and thanks for sharing the exciting work that the CNSC is pushing forward. Um, so now I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Reno Alamsia. Uh, Mr. Alamsia is the principal regulator at Indonesia's BAPA 10. He's here today to share Indonesia's regulator, uh, Indonesian regulator, regulator, wow, I'm stumbling over that one. The Indonesian regulator's experience as an embarking nation considering the deployment of SMRs. I'm really looking forward to this presentation. Uh, Mr. Alamsia, over to you. I, I, okay, thank you very much, Chair. Um, greeting to, to everyone. Um, in this presentation, I'd like to share with you the Indonesian regulatory infrastructure and cooperation for the licensing of SMR. I'm very happy to share with you this uh, experience uh, and also the fact that many that I would like to say is already said by the previous uh, presenter. So it would, would be easier for me to, to, to do this presentation. So Indonesia is considered as an embarking country for many years, many decades even. And in the recent years, there are some proposals to develop NPP in the country, including especially SMR, since Indonesia is an archipelagic country. So the question would be, what do we have in terms of regulatory infrastructure? What uh, preparation have been made? And what are challenges left? We have an independent regulatory body by, by that by law, our chairman report directly to the president of Indonesia. And with one office in Jakarta and about 270 technical staff, uh, we have a mandate uh, to regulate for both safety, security, and safeguard. We also have an internal TSO for regulatory research and equipped with some um, simple labs or training centers. Um, next, please. Um, uh, we have a long experience in regulating three research reactors with some other related facilities. And also that there were a proposal for designing a 10 megawatt thermal HTGR by BATAN, our government research institute, uh, where a few years ago, we grant them a site license. But then um, it turns that the government postponed uh, this project. And BATAN now uh, updates uh, a project called as NPP prototype project in uh, West Kalimantan, which is the second biggest island in the country. Another proposal came uh, from Torcon International, as you might know, to develop an MSR technology in the country. And there are also some other proposals. However, to date, I should say that there are no clear decisions expected from the central government uh, in the near future, unfortunately. But then uh, the regulatory body in other side was clearly asked by, by the government to prepare the regulatory framework for the NPP. Next, please. Um, next, please. Uh, we have a, a number of law and regulation related to NPP for safety and licensing require, requirement. The previous uh, slide, please. The previous slide, please. Anyway, uh, we are in the process of amending the 1997 nuclear energy law that we expect to provide enhancement in the area of safety and security, while at the same time, uh, we expect a better promote to the use of the NPP technology. In technical level, we are in the final process to amend uh, the Bapatan Chairman Regulation on NPP safety design uh, based on the new SSR 2 slash 1 ref 1 of the IEA 
that we expect uh, to be signed by our chairman before the end of this year. Next, please. Now, um, Indonesia is a contracting party and actively participant, uh, participate to many relevant international agreements, including the Convention on Nuclear Safety. Uh, I was uh, being a rapporteur uh, of the seventh uh, review meeting in 2017. And we also have a positive uh, response and feedback from the IRRS missions back to 2015 and 2019. Um, in accordance to the Vienna Declaration on Nuclear Safety, we actively update our regulation, adapting the IAEA and other international standards. But anyway, uh, at this time, we don't have a vendor design pre-licensing review in our law. But uh, it will not prevent us, the regulatory body, to make an open dialogue with our applicants. We have cooperation uh, with some national universities and research institutes where in one side we ask them to be our national our TSO and in other side we try to develop or at least to maintain our national capacity building. In the future uh, we could expect that uh, cooperation with international TSO would be also an open possibility. Surely, we expect to maintain and enhance both international and bilateral cooperation, especially with the vendor's country regulatory body. In fact, uh, the first BAPA-10 uh, international uh, cooperation was signed with the AECB, or currently you say it, uh, CNST. Well, uh, next please. Um, Next, please. Next uh, slide, please. Well, um, many challenge, challenges left for us still, anyway. For example, we need a better HRD plan, considering that uh, there are no definite uh, NPP design available at this time. But in other side, we also have to pay attention uh, to our aging facility. Um, you know that uh, our first and uh, 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 our first uh, research uh, reactor is already been operated for more than 51 years. Um, we also need to put many insight in the design uh, safety assessment regulation, such as the application of graded approach, uh, the commissioning consideration, which is very important for. Um, the intergenerational equality and also the supply chains problem with the CFSI issues. We have to pay attention with that. Um, another challenge is that uh, we possibly face the first of a kind technology while our existing regulation and our knowledge uh, mostly based, uh, based uh, on the light water reactors. Then, as we learn from the Fukushima accident, uh, other issue would be the leadership role and management for regulating safety, and also independent and reliable regulatory transparency and openness would also be put in test along with the effective international and bilateral cooperation. Next, please. Next. The last slide. Well, yeah, yeah. in short conclusion, uh, we have a high commitment for safety. Um, we are, um, but anyway, we are also just a happy kid, uh, if I may say, <laughs> expecting a better, uh, to better regulate SMR in the near future. So we very much welcome any international and bilateral cooperation to enhance uh, safety and licensing. Uh, with that, uh, I thank you very much for your patience and welcoming your uh, comment and question. Uh, 
Uh, last slide, please. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Really appreciate the presentation. Um, and now, folks, we're going to turn to our final panelist, Ms. Rashan Clavero, who is the Deputy CEO of the Candu Owners Group. In this role, she interacts with domestic and international Candu utilities, supplier participants, industry partners, and other key stakeholders. She's also the chair of the SMR Task Force for the Canadian Standards Association and sits as the vice chair on the Committee Developing Nuclear Safety Standards. So I will now turn it over to you to learn more about what um, you have been hearing from SMR vendors navigating the system. Thank you, Molly. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, I'm honored to be here and joining my colleagues today. I also want to thank IFNEC for the invitation to Can Do Owners Group. So I'll give a perspective from, uh, I'll, I'll briefly speak about the vendors, but it's also this, um, a perspective from the industry, from our utility members. So I'll go through a brief introduction on COGS SMR activities, speak to an industry review that was performed on the regulatory framework, and then I'll get into some of the supporting activities that we're doing through Can Do Owners Group, um, speak briefly about the Pan-Canadian Roadmap, and also speak to international collaboration, which is really what this panel is all about. And then I'll leave the group with some key messages. Uh, I just wanted to mention Can Do Owners Group, we are a not-for-profit member-funded organization. So we're made up of the Can Do owners around the world. We've been supporting collaborative research and projects and information sharing between the Can Do owners for over 35 years. But in 2017, our mandate was expanded. It was expanded to include advanced technologies and small modular reactors. And really, what does that expansion mean? Well, it means that we needed to put together a program that was really looking at achieving alignment between organizations involved in SMR development and deployment. And I list there some of the organizations that we work with. Academia, research, supply chain. Sorry, could you go back one slide? Um, academia, research, the supply chain, um, standards development, utilities, technology providers, regulators, and government. It's really about ensuring that the international requirements support the export of technology in an efficient manner. This underscores the need for a harmonized Team Canada. And I do want to mention that we have had success with the Team Canada approach in the past. Um, the Can Do fleet is an example where we have deployed that fleet internationally and looked to methods in the past to try to harmonize regulation. Um, so again, the common Team Canada approach to converge on a common set of requirements and collectively influence the international community. So in 2017, we formed a COG SMR technology forum made up primarily of our utility members. It was followed a year later by the SMR Vendor Participant Program. Next slide, please. So in this slide, it's a high-level over, high overview of the COG SMR activities. We have a CEO forum, um, which is really focused on alignment for a Canadian strategy from the utility perspective. That forum has a working group supporting it, which is looking at various um, areas that will in, enable deployment, things like a market study, economic impact, partnership models. Um, in the middle there, we have the SMR Technology Forum, which I mentioned was formed in 2017. And that forum really has three objectives. The first is to look at approaches to SMR regulation in Canada. The second is to provide input to decision makers. So whether that be technical input or position papers. And the third is international harmonization, which I'll speak to a little later. On the far right, you see a box for the SMR Vendor Participant Program. So this program, uh, we have 10 vendors currently part of this, and um, these vendors are all going through um, the vendor design review with the regulator in Canada. So this, this program focuses on sharing vendor perspectives, addressing common challenges, contributing to common technical positions, and really ensuring a strong ne network amongst the vendors to support SMR deployment. We also assist the vendors in understanding operator challenges. So we give them opportunities to work closely with the SMR Technology Forum and share perspectives. And down the center there in the gray box, uh, we've recently formed the Canadian Nuclear Industry SMR Secretariat. This is to support the Pan-Canadian Roadmap and uh, an action plan that's coming later this year. I'll speak to that a little later. Next slide, please. 
So Hugh Robertson touched on this earlier. The regulatory framework in Canada is shown in this little uh, box on the right. Industry spent the beginning of uh, 2017 and 18 looking at reviewing the existing framework. And this included regulatory documents as well as standards um, from the Canadian Standards Association. They were looking at the existing requirements to understand where they can be applied and where further guidance may be required. This was all used as input for the Pan-Canadian Roadmap as well. They performed a cursory review of the standards under CSA as well, and that work continues today. And as mentioned earlier by uh, Greg Zankowski, uh, we continue to review and benchmark against other guidance. So Greg had mentioned the IAEA SMR regulators form. We do continue to look at the white papers that that form has been developing. Uh, we also look at Nuclear Energy Institute white papers and recently have um, used uh, some of their inputs from based on nuclear security and also looking at codes and standards. We've uh, reached out to the Office of the Nuclear Regulator in the UK and we're also looking at the work that's being performed currently under the USNRC CNSC agreement and joint review. Next slide please. So as I mentioned the earlier review on the regulatory framework it led into the Pan-Canadian SMR roadmap and really provided support to the Regulatory Readiness Working Group. This roadmap was a key enabler in, and was released in November 2018. It has 53 recommendations to enable development and deployment in Canada. I've included a link there and I do encourage people to take a look at this roadmap because many of the things that are highlighted in there do apply around the world globally. The report presents key findings on barriers and challenges to the deployment of SMRs under the current regulatory regime. The roadmap conclusions specifically for the regulatory readiness area declare that there were no major impediments to the future licensing of SMRs within Canada. However, there were areas that were identified requiring additional discussion with the CNSC and other regulatory bodies. These areas included nuclear liability, staff training, accident management, emergency preparedness, security requirements as well. And finally, the last box there, I just mentioned the uh, new formation of the nuclear industry SMR secretariat. The secretariat um, together, CNA and COG have formed this to track recommendations and input into Canada's action plan. And that plan will be released later this year. It's basically a follow up on those 53 recommendations and a commitment from industry and um, all the key stakeholders that we are still committed to SMR deployment within Canada. Next slide, please. So what I show here is how we're working together to collaborate on position papers. As I mentioned, based on the findings from the regulatory review, there were a number of areas that were identified by industry to develop guidance for SMRs. So I'm giving one example here, and this is the example of the COG SMR security task team. We formed this, formed this task team earlier this year, and it was formed with experts from the existing CANDU community. I think what I would like to emphasize here is the way that we can move forward is really to leverage and use the existing expertise that we have. We have over 60 years of expertise in nuclear technology, both um, design, development, uh, deployment and operations. So we need to tap into that expertise. And that's really what we're trying to do through the Candy Owners Group. So as you can see, the process we're using is to review existing guidance first. We then draft a set of principles, involve industry and stakeholders in a review, and then issue the paper. So for the SMR security task team, we did that earlier this year. We're in the process right now of actually working with our regulator to understand what, how, these, um, how this paper and the principles that have been drafted could maybe impact the nuclear security regulations within Canada. Similarly, the other topic areas, um, nuclear liability, we've uh, kicked off a task team in April of this year. And we're also looking at intelligent customer principles and best practices as they apply to SMRs. Next slide, please. So speaking specifically on international cl collaboration, there has been a lot of work done over the last year. But international harmonization of regulatory requirements, it can be an enabler, but we have to make sure that the model that we use is actually an enabler and doesn't hinder the process. So there are some risks to consider. And I've listed two here. One, of course, is taking the most limiting requirements from each country. And the second is introducing delays or changes to the process midstream. 
Bill Magwood spoke earlier about how this is not an easy process to get to that harmonization. It takes time, it takes effort. But we have to remember that we have to be mindful of the schedules that are in play in the various countries. We have to find a way to make this work with the timelines that every country has in place. Uh, so recently, COG and World Nuclear Association came together to draft a lessons learned on international harmonization of transport regulations. And this is really an example that we can benchmark because it is a successful um, harmonization around the world. Uh, there are follow-up meetings on that, and we're working with CNSC as well. They are convening a meeting with international regulators. It was delayed due to the coronavirus, but we will now try to um, get that going again and moving forward. The U.S.-Canada Executive Task Force is also a force that was formed last year, and they have discussions that are ongoing in the areas of common interest. And this was one of the task force where we worked with them. This is uh, primarily um, NEI and CNA. So we worked with them to get access to that white paper on security. And again, later this year, there's going to be an EPRI and a joint, uh, a COG joint webinar. It's planned for September. Again, looking at positive model, models for harmonization, some of the challenges and potential key areas to collaborate. Next slide, please. I think what I'd like to leave the group with are three key messages. Harmonization requires collaboration, not only between regulators, but also between the industry players, the vendors, supply chain, and the operators. Although the regulators have the responsibility to develop those regulations, industry has an obligation to provide to regulators its perspective to inform those regulatory decisions. Collaboration is hard work and it does not happen organically. Organizations such as NEA, IAEA, WNA and COG have a key role to play in facilitating collaboration between their respective stakeholders and they themselves have to learn to collaborate together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and perhaps just a self-serving comment, thank you so much for uh, commending the uh, SMR roadmap to the group. Um, you know, personally, I think it's a great document and thank you for your participation in it. Um, I'd also just like to thank all of our, uh, all of our panelists. It's um, been a very dynamic session. There is just so much to, uh, to take in. We've heard a lot about the opportunities that we have together moving forward. We're now going to move into our, um, our question and answer period. Um, I'll launch our panel discussion now. You can see some instructions up on the, um, on the screen. Um, and I would just encourage folks to continue to keep your lines muted and, unless you are speaking. So maybe I will just begin with our, and this is going to test the bounds of my technological capability, let's just be clear. Um, so first of all, for our panelists, question number one. Um, We've heard a lot about, um, about the imperative of acting now, but why is it important for countries and partners to act now in order to harmonize regulatory frameworks and seize the international um, SMR opportunity? So the big question, why now? Um, now, there is the hand function if anybody's feeling compelled to speak first, but if not, I'm very happy to, uh, to call on people. Mr. Magwood, am I seeing a hand? Okay, over to you. Yeah. That was a hand. Perfect. Love I have it. To, have to make sure I know how to lower it now. <laughs> um, I, I think that's I think that's a very important question, and I, I, the answer is a very global answer, and that is because countries around the world um, have set 2050 generally as a target for by which they like to become carbon neutral. Many countries, UK, for example, recently has made that decision, and when you when you walk back. What does that mean um, for new technologies? It basically means that technologies that are gonna to contribute to that goal really have to be on the market by around 2030, which is 10 years from now. So if there's SMR technologies that we wanna see play a role in those markets, they really have to start, they have to, they have to show up pretty quickly. And so you only have a short period of time to get all this to happen. And when you're talking about beginning to deploy these technologies, um, 10 years is not very long. Uh, and, and, and quite frankly, for if there's a technology that thinks it's going to contribute in that time frame, and they have not yet submitted uh, to regulatory review, they're really, really running out of time. Um, so, this, so it really is a very tight uh, schedule. And the sooner we do this, the, the better. 
Thanks very much. Russian. Thanks, Molly. I completely agree with um, with what Bill has raised in terms of uh, you know the timeline and and the issues around um, how long it actually takes to deploy these uh, technologies. I think the other thing to point out is in the current situation that we're in, you know, economies in many countries are suffering right now. We really need to look at what are those stimulus items to get the economy going again. How do we bring jobs into our countries? How do we support our supply chains? And I do think that SMRs are a big piece of that. In addition to that, we have a long history in nuclear technology. And the next evolution are these SMRs. So, you know, we need to tap into that and move towards the future and help the generation that's coming into nuclear to move that way as well. So I think it's all about, you know, moving with the, where this economy is going, where the industry is going, and really bringing that clean energy future to, to us as soon as we can. The mute button is going to kill me. Um, <laughs> Mr. Halzia, could I, would you like to jump in on this? I'll put you on my, perhaps my up next list. Uh, Hugh, would you be interested in, uh, in speaking to this as Canada's regulator? Sure. Uh, so I think just to add and build on what uh, Mr. Magwood was saying, of course, the timing is, is critical here. And I think a lot of these technologies are being proposed as a key solution to support clean energy initiatives, uh, you know, and there is an urgency to address that those climate change challenges. So, and of course, we're not talking about one, two, or three of these. These are dozens of uh, technologies that are being looked at, deployed. But they cannot be looked in isolation, country by country. Uh, so, from that perspective alone, regulatory harmonization is really the only thing that makes sense to achieve the timelines that uh, that was just mentioned there. So, you know, and if you look at the concept of, you know, theoretically, a safe facility in one country should be a safe facility in another country. Of course, there's, you know, geographic, geological differences, but the actual facility, um, there's no reason why, um, you know, you know, there's always technicals, but it's looking at why can we do this? And there's a lot more reasons why we can than why we can't. And I think that's very important. And there is a small window of opportunity that if we miss it, we'll miss it. Uh, you know, for a long period of time. Thank you. Yeah. Great point. Uh, would anybody, any of the other panelists like to jump in? I'm looking at your unmute button, so I'll just keep. Greg, in you go. Uh, yes, I wouldn't mind. And and for your knowledge, Molly, I don't see a hand anywhere, so I can raise it, but you are not going to see. <laughs> Anyhow, will, so if you want to put me on the spot anytime, I, I I would like to contribute to the discussion. But awesome. coming coming back to your questions. Uh, current problems and challenges for large nuclear projects can be summarized by some interlinked issues. Diminishing public confidence resulting from ever-increasing stringency and complexity of regulatory oversight process. This also includes licensing and inspections required at the current plants. Need for huge upfront investment due to increasing cost of constructions in particular, and lack of long-term broadly acceptable government policies regarding the role of nuclear energy in the future. So you see, I think SMRs, if we can harmonize the approach, we can answer many of those issues in a positive way. Because mm -hmm. as I indicated in one of my, of my slides, we have an option to deliver faster, cheaper and better. But for this, we need to harmonize our approaches to licensing and possibly also standardize the designs of the proposed applications because we cannot deal with 50 design being put in front of the regulators. This is simply impossible. And this also leads to a divergence in our, in our approaches and, and, and it will also affect our effect efficiency and effectiveness in deploying those reactors. And as Bill Magwood mentioned, we need something quickly. And 10 years seems to be a long time, but not for nuclear power projects. Yes, that's because those projects have to be supported by experimental investigations and, and many experiments are required as a proof of concept. 
When this proof of concept is received, we have to start, of course, a licensing process. And as we know, the licensing process can be as long as, as 10 years. It happened already in the past. But being conservative, a combination of licensing and construction process is, can be easily estimated at about 10 years. So all this needs to be considered and we have to harmonize and harmonize and harmonize. I cannot say it often enough. So that's my two cents. Thank you very much. No, and a great two cents it is. Thank you very much. I, very, I really appreciate that. Now, um, I'm looking at my colleague, Deanne Cameron, who's on the screen right now. I know that we wanted to reserve 20 minutes from comments um, or questions and answers from folks who are on the line. Uh, I'm also seeing that the question and answer section is blowing up, which is great, and uh, a lot of positive exchange happening back and forth there. Um, Deanne, give me the thumbs up if you think we should do one more question for the panelists. Okay, we'll do one more for the panelists, and then we will go to uh, to the line, but please keep your questions coming on uh, on the Q&A, because I know that Deanne is actively responding to those as well. So thanks, everybody, for your engagement. Um, Perhaps in the discussion, we talked a little bit about the airline industry. I heard that as, a, as kind of a, an interesting analogy, but I um, was wondering, you know, as we look to, to other sectors who can sort of provide guideposts for us as we're moving forward, be interested in panelists' views to whether or not there are other um, sectors that we can draw inspiration from um, as we sort of look to how we develop um, international harmonization and we implement our path forward. Like, is there anywhere that we should be looking to for inspiration? Um, and so, and maybe I'll just sort of merge two questions that I was thinking about asking. And in that context, also um, would ask your views on um, how can we see the IAEA um, also helping us as we, um, as we move forward and increasing with international cooperation? So two questions there. One, industry that we can be looking at. Two, how can the IAEA help us as we come together? So two questions for panelists there, and then we're going to go to the questions and answers um, as we move forward. Um, and so where am I going to start? Greg, you said you were always ready to go. Why don't we start with you, and then we'll work our way back around. In this particular uh, case, I have very little to add, to be perfectly honest, because we look at, inter at aviation industry as well as a, as a model for harmonization of not only licensing of and certification approaches, but also as a model how the industry can standardize. And it's very important because if you want to create this global system for deployment of SMRs, we have to try to achieve two international agreements. One will be for um, cooperation among the regulators to establish common, common, common set of regulations at the technology neutral level. And the second one for cooperation of vendors where relevant industry technical standards and code will be developed develop and strict mechanisms uh, deployed to also arrive as the technology neutral approaches to the design of, of, of SMRs. I think this is absolutely crucial. And that's what I can take away from the aviation, from the aviation industry. Now, uh, regarding the role of the IEA, of course, we, somebody has to lead, uh, especially the, uh, the efforts at the international level. And as I, 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 I finished my presentation, in, you know, some, kind of a negative connotation saying that currently we have no roadmap for the deployment of SMRs. I made a roadmap at the international level. So, so there is the need for international organization to, take, to, to, to really take the leadership and establish a roadmap for deployment. And this roadmap has to consider harmonization of the first priority. So let it be IEA or any other organization which is prepared to take the lead. Super. Thanks so much. I'm going to go to Hugh and then I will go to uh, Bill Magwood. Hi, thank you, Molly. Um, I guess for me personally, just um, looking at where um, there might be other industries or other aspects we would like to look at, just the current situation I find fascinating around the, the COVID-19 pandemic and the way that the world in, in not all cases, but in many cases are sharing information quickly and compiling and, and the way it's moving back and forth. 
And then you take that to the next step when we start looking at the uh, sort of identification and ultimately the production of a vaccine, how the regulators are preparing themselves and looking how that they can uh, enable an efficient process for approving those vaccines while still ensuring safety. Um, so I think there'll be a great opportunity for lessons learned that the nuclear industry really should take advantage of. So uh, I think that's, uh, you know, if we're looking ahead, I think that'll be quite interesting. Uh, and then if you're talking about the sort of part two of your question, uh, I really think, you know, if, if we look at the IAEA, for example, and, and maybe I'm, uh, I don't mean to steal a little bit of Greg's thunder, but uh, sort of hot off the press with the SMR regulators forum has been meeting and sort of, as, as he mentioned, uh, sort of planning their next uh, stream of work, um, the, the team was telling me that one of the things they've committed to is they really agreed to work harder on a framework for mutual recognition of regulators' outputs. And I think that in and of itself is, you know, you get an international body that's looking at that is really key. And so I think, um, you know, it's these international groups, whether it's the NEA, and I know that uh, Mr. Magwood has been working on and he spoke about that, or the IAEA and these, these uh, forums where they're also looking at things and, uh, you know, security by design. I know uh, Fred DeMarker was mentioning that we have brought in the World Institute on Nuclear Security to actually help us. And, and we hosted, Kathleen Heppel-Masis, one of my colleagues, hosted that forum here in Canada the, in, in November of last year. And we brought in industry as well and was really informative and helpful in those kind of things, I think is what we need to continue to do and engage broadly. And it's not just a regulatory issue, it's, it's industry and bringing everybody together. So I think those are the real opportunities uh, that we need on that front, so thank you. Super, thank you. Over to you. Um, just a couple of co comments. I, I think it's a it's a great a great question because we have started looking at the analogs in other industries to see what can be learned. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, President Velshi has suggested that we hold a workshop to explore this, and so that's now being planned, and we'll announce it soon. I think it's being scheduled for November of this year to bring people together to look at some of these other industries like the airline industry, uh, certain aspects of materials transportation. Um, even the pharmaceutical industry might have some lessons about how we can um, work across uh, borders in order to try to get uh, the work of regulators accepted by other regulators and, and what lessons can be learned from that. So that's something we'll be exploring. Um, although I think we all understand that nuclear is a bit different from other industries and that there's a, a context that you have to appreciate. Um, and and while while I think that you know I think Greg and, and and Hugh both pointed to some things that the IAEA is currently engaged with to look at um, some um, uh, SMR activities, um, I actually think that there'll be more success to be gained um, by having regulators who are deeply interested in the subject to work together. Um, and and I and the reason I think that international organizations will play a side role to this is because not all countries are going to want to do this in the time frame that we're talking about. It is not going to be 30 or 100 countries that are going to really be focused on this. It's going to be five countries or, or six countries. I, I don't know what the number is, but it's not going to be a large number. So it, it's probably something where international organizations like NEA and IEA can help support that. But the leadership is going to have to come from the regulators. It's going to have to come from um, uh, from the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, UK ONR, um, ASN in France, it's going to have to come from those bodies um, because they have to be the ones to take the leadership role. And so um, that sort of shifts the onus back to, to you. He can't dodge it. He's going to have to um, deal with this. Um, the, the regulators are going to have to show the leadership. And if they don't do it, uh, I will be honest, it will not happen. There's no there's no framework to push this to happen if the regulators don't take the initiative. And I think the best example of that um, was the uh, MNEP, MDEP initiative, uh, the Multinational Design Evaluation um, Program. Um, that was not uh, something the governments had, had talked about. It's something the regulators decided to do on their own. They put it together. It was very successful for a long period of time, and it did what largely it was envisioned to do. Um, so that's something where I think you really have to see um, the leadership and the regulatory organizations move forward in order to try to solve some of these issues. Super, thanks so much. Rashna? 
Uh, thank you, uh, Molly, and I, I agree with everything that my colleagues have mentioned. And Hugh mentioned the wind security workshop. I think that that was a really good example, and it was actually the launch for that security paper that we wrote. So having more workshops like that, um, whether it's uh, you know through COG and CNSC or whether it's through organizations like IAEA, that's really where we can have those discussions collectively inter at the international level, and then choose target areas. But I agree with what Bill is saying. We really, I mean, there's two things there that he touched on. One, we need to build on our successful models that already exist. So that's what, one of the reasons that um, COG and WNA started pursuing a, a paper on the transport model, transport of radioactive materials. But in addition to that, we need to start small. We have to work with a few member countries and then expand once we've achieved some harmony. Uh, we need to recognize that the countries are moving on different schedules. So once we have that you know, collective agreement at a smaller level, we can definitely expand that to the 30 or 40 countries. But really to see some success, we have to start with a smaller group, a focused group of like-minded countries. Thanks so much. That face was me trying to get back to my mute button while I was sort of scanning the Q&A stuff. Um, so thank you very much. I think what we might do now is uh, open up for some questions. My sense is, is that perhaps, yes, Deanne, I will turn to you and maybe we can get some questions that are in from, um, to be read out from the line. Uh, could we unmute Deanne's line, please? How's that? Aces. That's good, okay, great. Uh, hi, everybody. We've got a lot of great questions going on in the uh, chat window and in the question window. I'm going to uh, highlight a few of them for the panelists. Uh, one line, in, in fact, three lines of inquiry that have popped up through a number of different questions. And maybe I'll just highlight them now. And uh, Molly, maybe you can throw that out to the group and people can uh, decide which of the three areas they'd like to, uh, to respond to. The first line of inquiry that I'd like to highlight is uh, some questions about, uh, um, the question is phrased as follows. How do we harmonize um, regulatory approaches in light of so many different types of designs out there and a question about whether or not there is a need for a benchmark or reference SMR designs um, similar to the LWL, uh, LWR sector, would this facilitate regulatory and licensing uh, harmonization? That's sort of one, uh, one line of inquiry around how do we approach harmonization in, in the face of such diversity of design. Another line of questioning, uh, related but, uh, but, but a little bit different. How is regulating SMRs fundamentally different from regulating and licensing gigawatt scale reactors? And there's a very good question, I think, which is to, to, uh, to ask the panelists to identify two specific examples of challenges that are specific to SMR licensing that would be different um, than what we've experienced as a regulatory community globally in licensing gigawatt scale reactors. And then a last question, someone challenging the, um, uh, the utopic dream of the airline universal uh, regulatory model and asking whether or not harmonization is um, as a, it sort of a, the, uh, would, would be the, the, the goal and whether or not that is a, a vision of perfection and in this case is perfection the enemy of good and good enough is striving for that ultimate harmonization going to actually ultimately slow us down. Three great questions um, and very strategic questions. I think we've touched on those themes over the course of the, of the time. I'm mindful that we have about five minutes, so we'll probably end up going a minute or two late, but what I might do is just do around the world for each of our um, panelists and seek your views on each of these. For our participants, I would note that all of your questions have been captured, and so we are going to take a look at all of these, um, and I'd like to thank everybody for their, for their engagement in this. So maybe um, we will start, I'm just gonna go on my screen sort of top to bottom. So um, Bill Magwood, you're up first. Um, I think, uh, let, me, let me focus on the last one. I think it's an important question. And I, I do think that everyone 
that we are working with is very realistic about um, how far nuclear can follow the example of the airline industry. So I don't, I don't think that's the nirvana that we're aiming at. What we're trying to do is to see if there are mechanisms, regulatory mechanisms, um, international policy mechanisms that can help us as we try to not get 100% where the airlines are, or airline industry is, but even if we get 15% of the way or 20% of the way, um, we will much be much better off than we are today, which is which is no place. Um, so I so I do so I don't think it's really the perfect being the enemy of the good. I think it's just looking for models and knowledge that will help us as we try to move forward because we're starting really from zero. There there's virtually no um, framework for adopting technologies approved te nuclear technologies approved in Canada and and building them in Japan. There's just no way to do that. Uh, but if we can get part of the way there, we'll, we'll, we'll have learned a lot. Um, I mean, I, I think we could spend too much time talking about all these questions, but I, 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 will, I will say that um, as the industry is looking at these technologies um, and, and, and exercising it their, themselves, um, I think that there will eventually be a selection process. I don't think that someone is going to select. I think there's going to be a natural selection. Evolution will, will kick in, and we will da be down to a much, much smaller number of projects than we have today. I think IEA counts over 50 different projects floating around out there. Um, there's not enough regulators to go around to assess 50 different projects, so there's going to have to be some kind of uh, down selection. And I, and I do think that when the programs I see in Japan, the United States, Canada, UK, other countries, that the money that's available to support all these projects is going to begin to sort through um, what the, the ones that the countries think are most successful. And my guess is that probably within three to five years, we'll be down to much, much more manageable number. And we won't be talking about 50 different concepts. We'll be talking about more like, you know, less than 10. Um, and and that will enable the regulators to really begin to get to work. The, the danger, however, and I'll, I'll close with this, the danger is that if we spend five or 10 years getting to that point, as I said before, we gotta have things on market by 2030. So if we spend five or 10 years deciding which ones to work on, we're gonna miss the window and it'll be too late. And that will be a real shame. Thanks so much. And just uh, with that probably being the last intervention, big thank yous for, for your engagement today and, and thank you for the organization of this great event. Um, is it Rashna, maybe I'll just pass uh, over to you and then Hugh, you're up next. Thank you, Molly. So I think I will um, tackle the question on how does the SMR regulation differ from our existing, uh, you know, larger fleet? Um, I think, and I'm going to give what we're actually hearing from our vendors and from the technology developers. On the positive side, we're hearing there's a lot of enablers, right? The regulatory framework in Canada is ready to address innovative and disruptive designs. Hugh touched on that earlier. We have a long history globally on development, deployment, and operations of nuclear technology, so we can leverage our existing expertise. I think it's important to remember that you know, if, and, and you touched on this as well, if the technology is sound, if the science is there, it can be regulated. Um, but where it does differ, and what we're hearing, I touched on in my presentation, where there's more prescriptive regulation in place that really applies specifically to large scale reactors. And some of those examples are on the security side and also on the liability side. So I'll give those as kind of the two examples. The other challenges for our vendors, um, in the past, a lot of the, you know, the way that the large scale reactors were funded was through government support um, and through a lot, lot of, you know, private investment. But with so many competing designs, it is hard to focus investors on a specific design. It's also a challenge to make sure that you've got the government backing you up. So it's about having that clear policy in place that really supports SMRs as clean energy. And I think Bill has spoken a few times on the policy pieces. So there are some differences, but you know, again, while the challenges are there, we have, you know, these are not brand new designs. A lot of them are bringing old designs back to the forefront. Um, we can find ways to license these and to regulate these. We just have to decide which ones we're gonna do that with. Thanks. Super. And likewise, thank you for all of your work and preparation to make today such a great uh, and dynamic conversation. Hugh, up, over to you. 
Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Maybe building on what uh, Mr. Magwood had said in a previous uh, question there where he uh, definitely uh, put the responsibility back in the regulator's lap. While I agree, the uh, certainly the international, uh, I still believe they have a role, but I absolutely agree on the, you know, the mature regulators, and that's why our president has pushed these bilateral agreements and has really stepped up and, and uh, along with the, uh, the, uh, the commissioner there, the, the president of the USNRC, to, uh, to, to move forward on this. And one of the interesting things we found out as we've worked together over the last few months with my colleagues there at the USNRC is when we look at our RegDoc 115, which really highlights uh, you know, specific areas that from a licensing sp perspective that SMR vendors will have to look at and that the new uh, licensing modernization project for non-light waters in the USNRC, we see a lot of similarities. In fact, I heard from my counterpart, there could be you know, 80% of what we note in RegDoc 115 that's relevant, and we see a lot of uh, relevant material in that licensing modernization project. So there is a, a lot there that we can build on. And, and as Mr. Magwood said, we, we're not, we may not get 100%, but if we get, I, I think we can get higher than the 25, 30. I think we can get 75, 80 perhaps, if we really look at this. And, and, and the bilateral, of course, is, is a really, is a quicker and more efficient way to go on this and we can build out from there as as we see and, and we build those things we're still working with the uk onr but i think there really is a lot of positive and we have to pursue both of these uh, approaches to getting this done in this short window of opportunity we have and thank you i love it when reg doc 115 is common parlance among a group i think that's fantastic um th thank you very much for uh, for all of the work that uh, that you have done and put into this it's great seeing um the momentum behind the cnsc and some of the great innovative thinking that's coming out so thank you very much um greg i'm going to turn it over to you and then um mr alamcia will uh will give you the final word uh thank you very much I know that we are already over time a little bit, so I will give a very short answer to each question posed. First, how to harmonize international approaches? I would rather rephrase this question and, and, and ask it, to what extent can we harmonize regulatory approaches? Because we have to, we have to remember that each national approach differs from, uh, from IEA safety standards. However, not, however, member states are trying to either adopt or adapt IEA safety standards to improve their national approaches, but they differ. They differ significantly. So we focus on technology issues, but we have to remember that there are regulatory issues as well because those differences in the, in the national frameworks are there and are very important in terms how the regulatory framework is applied to the licensing of new designs. Challenges to licenses, uh, licensing, of course, the requirements have been largely developed for the existing or conventional, conventional nuclear power plants. And in order to apply them to SMRs, we have to think not only about the tech aspects of the technology, but we have to think mainly about the risk posed by those facilities. So that means that the current uh, framework has to be graded down, taking risk into account. Any action, licensing actions can, has to be commensurate with the risk of the facilities and the risk of activities. This needs to be considered. And fi fi finally, can harmonization slow down the progress of, on SMRs? I don't personally, I don't think so because provision for safety design and operation of nuclear power plants are, are in broad terms driven by the commitment of member state, states to achieve fundamental safety objectives and to implement fundamental safety principles. So that means there is a common denominator and if this common denominator is applied this will increase eff effectiveness and efficiency of national reviews. So that's in short, short answer to each of the questions. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this very exciting seminar. Thanks. That's super. Thank you very much. Perhaps now I can turn to um, Mr. Elamcia. I think you might still be on mute. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Molly. 
um, harmonization and standardization is really tempting. It's a magic word for embarking country, of course. But uh, from national point of view, uh, the basic idea is to make nuclear energy more competitive, competitive economically, but uh, in the long run, I mean. But at the same time, uh, safety is always a top priority. So harmonizing regulatory framework, our regulatory framework to international standard is a very important issue. Uh, for an embar embarking country, I believe um, it could mean a faster learning process, whereas um, they should also maintain, uh, maintain their independent uh, safety assessment. It means that even though if we have harmonization and um, standardization, in technically it means that uh, every safety case, safety analysis report came to us, we have to evaluate it uh, thoroughly uh, as usual, uh, even with uh, technology inclusive uh, risk informed performance based approach. And for sure, um, um, uh, harmonizing with international uh, standard in some level would help enhance uh, the process. But anyway, uh, we have this responsibility to uh, publish the safety evolution report to the public um, scientifically. So, um, it's important the cooperation in one side is uh, important cooperation between the regulatory body uh, of, of the countries, but in other side, um, the regulatory body of a country have to have developed their own capabilities. So independent doesn't mean anything without technical competency. We are aware on that. So. This is very important. We learn about harmonization, we learn about uh, standardization, but at the end, we have to do our job as an independent and effective regulatory body. That's, that's one thing. The second thing that I would like to mention to the agency, um, the agency has published many important information on development of SMR technology, of course. Um, as demonstrated to date, I believe that the agency has maintained its uh, position as technologically neutral. Um, with regard uh, on safety and licensing in general, IAEA has uh, laid a very strong foundation uh, of safety, especially in the SSR 2-1, uh, REF1, SSR 2-2, REF1, and related safety guidance like uh, SST2, SST3, uh, and others. But therefore, the agencies should continue their effort in uh, further developing guidelines for uh, safety and licensing of SMR where possible. Uh, but it could be challenging, I believe. So, uh, in, uh, so then, uh, to overcome this problem, a documented technical cooperation project with a specific country on a specific technology might be useful uh, for other uh, country who intend to apply the same or similar technology. So I guess uh, this is our message uh, to IAEA. And I believe that uh, many useful things uh, and lessons learned can be learned from many open documents also, such as NEI uh, 1804 and the Canadian uh, DIS uh, 1804, the Red Drop T354, the regulatory readiness, um, and for sure the IEA SMR Regulators Forum uh, Interim Report. Uh, this document may help regulators develop their own regulatory framework for SMR in accordance with their national position and interest. Again, this is uh, a very important uh, 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 baseline. All, uh, anyway, it's also a little bit difficult uh, to say uh, that uh, 
the situation in our country is like a leapfrog, if you want to say that. Uh, since what we have learned and exist in our regulation is basically uh, pretty much a large uh, light water reactor. So this is another big challenge uh, as well for, for us. Well, anyway, thank you uh, so much for, uh, for giving me opportunity to join this uh, uh, seminar. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you so much for being here and for all of the preparation and work that you did to make today such a success. Um, colleagues, it would be impossible to summarize um, the very rich discussion that we've had today, but maybe let me just take a shot at three big points that I've heard. I would say the first is that 10 years means urgency in our space and we've got to move fast. And I think that's one of the big messages that I've heard today. Um, we also need to move together. We want to build a global market, but we're going to need leaders to get there. And, you know, sort of those jurisdictions that um, see an opportunity that can pull together, can help us get where we want to go together. And that we also have some issues of the commons that we're going to want to work through. Um, and so, you know, as we heard about nuclear liability, the opportunities to, um, to sort of build some of these um, regimes for embarking countries, there's some opportunities there as well. But I think together we all see a huge opportunity for small modular reactors. We see the rules and regulations um, as we uh, sort of set the framework for a low carbon economy. This is going to be a huge part of what we want to do uh, in setting the sort of building the future we want and the rules and standards for the future that we want. So thank you, everybody, very much for a, uh, for a great and dynamic conversation. Um, I'd like to say, say a special thank you to my team and to IFNEC for getting this all set up. Um, it could not have been um, better organized, particularly for a Luddite like myself. Um, and uh, I just wish everybody a tremendous remainder of the day. Thank you very much.